Welcome back to the channel. In this next installment on the mass transit message versioning, I'm gonna talk about some ways that we can version messages and go over a few scenarios. I'm also gonna to get to some user questions around how to version enums. So first I'm gonna start off with a new message type that I've added here called get order status and order status. Now this is a pretty simple type, get order status, you pass in an order ID, and then I fill in some fluff that comes back. Uh, I can simulate this in the UI, I execute it, and I get an order ID, the order number, and the status. And that all goes through the message broker as expected. Now, let's say that we've added some new capabilities to this consumer. We add, say that now we want to be able to put like an expected ship date. Okay, well expected ship date doesn't exist yet because I haven't updated my contract. So let's go to my contracts, let's go to my order status. And let's put in an expected ship date. This is just a value that lets us put some stuff out there. Um, and we're going to get that extra piece of data. Now you'll notice this little noise down here. Just ignore that for now. This is something System Text JSON gives us to do. And it's actually pretty cool. Um, but first, I'm going to go update my contract. I have to update my version number again because we have to go to 6. We have to go and build it pack the NuGet package, because again, we're sharing with NuGet. These aren't project references. The code is directly using that NuGet package. So I've got to push that to my NuGet repo. I have to tell my NuGet repo that I need to refresh because I just pushed a new 1.06 version. And I'm going to not touch my API, but I'm going to update my components to have the new version 106. Because my API is in production, it's deployed, I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm now going to go over to my order status consumer. And I'm going to set my, uh, let's say, date time dot today plus time span dot from days. Let's say it's going to take three days. Three days sounds like a good amount of time for something to ship. I mean, I'd be upset, but, you know, we've got the Amazon expectations, but whatever. So let's go run this. So, again, my API is still running. Haven't touched it. Not a peep. We're going to go ahead and rerun this service. It's going to be up and running. We're gonna go back over to here, and now I haven't touched this at all. All I'm gonna do is hit execute with the same thing. And surprisingly, that expected ship date shows up. Now, it doesn't really show up, because if I go into my controller, and I try to use it, like, let's see here, here's my response. If I try to use response.message.expectedShipDate, it isn't there. But that little hack for that data for that dictionary of string element. This is a little trick with system text JSON where you can basically say, hey, if you do deserialize into this type and there are properties that I don't know how to handle, just chunk them into this dictionary. And then of course in my controller, because I'm just serializing out that message, J system text JSON sees that extension data and says, oh, well I will chunk all that stuff back out to the client as well. Might be good, might be bad. It's just kind of a trick that you can use to push some data back to a system without having to know about everything. But when I do go and update my controller so that I, say, have a downstream system that wants to use that expected ship date, I have that first class property that I can deserialize it into. So kind of a neat little feature and the transparency of how it just dumps it out in the same format it was there. Pretty slick stuff. So that's the JSON extension data. And it needs to be a type of dictionary string JSON element, and it'll just do what it needs to do. Pretty cool thing. So let's talk about another one of the things that we wanted to talk about. Let's say that I have my submit order command. And my submit order command takes the current properties of order ID, customer order number, and customer number. Now, let's say for whatever reason that the service needs to evolve, because again, this is a command, so it's owned by the consumer that consumes this message. So let's say that we want to add a new property in here to handle purchase order number. Now, because this isn't originally required, we don't want to require this, so we know it's going to be null, and we're going to say we're going to have a purchase order number. Now, this could be anything. I'm just using something that people can relate to. Uh, and I've added a new purchase order number to that. And I'm also gonna update my order submitted because you know I, I have this information now. Maybe I wanna share it back out with people who use this contract. So again, because I'm updating here, I'm gonna update my NuGet. I'm gonna set it up to another version. I'm gonna go pack it. 
I'm going to push it to my local NuGet repository. And then I'm going to go ahead and stop my order service here. I'm going to update the NuGet package for that service one more time. Again, the API is still on dot five. I haven't touched that. It's in production. Nothing to see here. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to update this to 107 because I'm in I'm incrementing the version number that I need for that. Because it's nullable, it's still backwards compatible. So I don't need to worry about that. But within the process submit order consumer, now I have an additional piece of data here. So first, I want to add my purchase order number to contacts.message.purchase order number because I want to add that to my event. But if I want to do some processing, I need to check to see that it's there. So like my normal order processing might be here. But then I might say, oh, well, if I know, if I could type, if I know the order number, so I could say like if context.message.purchase order, and let's just use string dot is null or empty. And if it's not null or empty, do the processing of this property. Because we might not have it. We may not have a purchase order number because that API is still accepting orders from people who were never submitting a purchase order. This is new behavior, but because it's nullable, we always wanna make sure that we can handle that backward compatible path. This might mean that we have to go look up a purchase order number or see if there is one or just do something or flag it for follow-up with the accounts payable department. Anything could be possible there or accounts receivable department. I'm not an accountant, obviously. Um, so that's how we can handle the versioning of that. Now, if we come in here and let's just say, let's just do another uh, simple little thing here. Let's just put it in the logger of the submit order consumer. And let's go ahead and log out. No purchase order provided. And the reason we do that is just because we're just gonna show that because there's no UI for that back end. There's nothing really to see here. So we're just gonna run it. So now we're gonna run it. We didn't change anything. It didn't change the message contract. If I go out to RabbitMQ and look at the submit order queue, it's still only bound to that original submit order message. That's the only one that it's consuming. So when I come in here and look and I go back to my UI, and let's go ahead and make sure I have Oh, let's go ahead and get my GUID order number. Let's get that so I don't have to create it for twice. So we're gonna try this out. We're gonna pass in an order ID and an order number, and we're gonna pass in a customer number of whatever, and we're gonna submit that order. At this point, we've published the message. We got a response, the order ID. Uh, well, we just returned the order ID. We didn't actually do anything with that. But if we look here in our logs, we see Nothing. Why did we not see anything? Hmm, interesting. Is it actually running? If we go back here to the queues. We can see it's there. Let's take a look here. I'm fairly sure we processed it. We don't write anything. So, oh, no, we do because we got the order ID back. So we did get a response. It's just for whatever reason, the logger didn't write the warning. Don't know why. We didn't pass one. So, crazy. Is it, uh, is it the controller? Let's look at the order controller. So the controller, when we do the post, submit, order model, request client, get response, order submission accepted. Okay, I don't know why we didn't get the warning message, but we were able to submit it with the old version of the contract and it worked. Let's do it again, see if it happens. Seems kind of odd to me, but we'll do it again. Customer numbers can kind of have strings in them, right? Yeah, so we got our order ID, we got that. I don't know why it didn't display the warning. Yeah, oh well, nothing I can do about it. It should have, but it didn't. Don't know why. But nonetheless, so that I'm still able to accept things with the old contract and it's able to return those back. Nothing broken, nothing bad. So that's just kind of a way to do it. If I wanted to add integers or things that could also be optional, definitely use nullable integers, you know, like int question mark or date time question mark or any of those, because then you can check if those properties are there and valid before you actually process the message. So let's look at one more thing that we want to do. 
We want to talk about, someone asked the question, how do I version enums? And enums are a little tricky because they're kind of like closed collections. It's like these are the valid values for an enum. So if I were to get a value back, the enum wouldn't have it or know it, and it would get an error deserializing. So something to seriously consider before just jumping in and using enums in your system. Um, the one thing that I would say is, and I created a message type for this here, so let's see if we can do it. So I created a process order command with an order priority. And I thought this would be just, you know, something completely separate. Order priority has default low and high. I mean, you can't get more basic than, a, than that kind of a new. And then I have an order process. And the order process just is a simple event. It doesn't have any additional types on it. But my process order consumer is going to use those different um, priorities to determine how quickly to process the order. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and just kind of run this as like a little demo case to kind of see what happens. Let me go ahead and fire these services back up. And I'm not going to start the backend service yet. I'm going to just leave this one running because what I want to do is I want to come in here and I want to process this order and I want to process it with a priority of high. And you'll notice I put the string high. And I'll go over that in a second. So I'm going to hit execute. I get a response back that just says hi, nothing super fancy. But I wanted to come over to RabbitMQ and give you kind of a view of what we see here. So the message is sitting in the queue. And if I look at this message, we can see that the message is serialized within the envelope. It has the OR ID. And the priority is written as two. So by default, Mass Transit is going to write your strings as number enums. Um, you can change that behavior by configuring the mass transit serializer, but I'm not going to do that for now because, you know, it's, it's not what we're here to talk about. The, the other thing that I will point out is that when I configured this API service, I added the JSON string enum converter to the options for ASP.NET's system tech JSON serializer options. So I added that converter to the list. You do it very similar with mass transit. You would say configure JSON serializer and you get the options. You would do the exact same thing as that. So that's kind of the key piece of code to get them serialized as strings if you want that. I just did it so that the UI and the API is more easy to understand and doesn't have to know magic, magic numbers of two. Um, yeah, so anyway, I'm gonna start the service back up now and we should see it immediately come up and start processing that order with a high priority, just like that is there. So again, service was offline, but again, RabbitMQ, durable messaging, hello, we got messages. So let's say we wanna add an enumeration value to that. So let's go ahead and stop the service and I'm gonna go into my contracts assembly yet again. I'm gonna make a version eight because you know we like to keep incrementing our version. And we're going to add a new priority called super low. I don't know, whatever, super low. And let's just call it three. Now our super low priority is gonna be like super, super slow, whatever, obviously it's super low. But we're gonna to go to our consumer and then we're gonna put a new case in here called super low, but it doesn't exist yet. And we're gonna say that that takes 30 seconds, whatever. Um, again, because I've incremented my contracts, I need to push this out. I need to get it onto the local NuGet server. I need to go to my NuGet, refresh my packages, install version 8. You'll notice that my API is still on 1.0.5. I have not versioned my API to do any of this stuff yet. It's still on the oldest version of the contracts that I could possibly have. So now it compiles. I've got my super low with my 30 seconds. Let's just say 20. Why not, right? We're having some fun. But now we're going to put this in here. We're going to build that out. And we are going to run our service again. So with our service set up to go, we're going to run it. We've added this new capability. But again, our API hasn't changed. It still has just the ability to do high because it doesn't know about super low. If I execute that, I, I just expect it's going to kind of do its thing, processing high, just like we thought it would. If I come in here and say normal, we will see that it is going to eventually process one normal, I think. Is it normal? No, it's not normal. It's default. <laughs> so that's obviously not going to deserialize. I don't know why the errors aren't showing up. That's weird. 
So if I do, yeah, so default worked. It's like something's not logging properly in the service. That must be the problem. Um, but yeah, priority default, piece of cake. The, uh, but I can't do super low because my API doesn't know about super low yet. So if I try to do super low here, it's going to blow up and say the model validation failed because that's not a valid order priority. But if I do come in here, stop my API service, and let's say I finally get around to upgrading my API because I need to be able to call this new command. I can upgrade that. I can just literally rebuild, redeploy. And now we get doop -doop -doop, the ability to do super low. And super low comes back. And if we go over to our service, it processed super low. So those are the ways that we can kind of version messages in a number of different ways. I've gone over three or four different scenarios. Definitely make comments if you have questions or think there's things that I haven't covered. There are probably some things I haven't covered, but you know, we're sharing messages through NuGet. You know, we have decoupled systems, order management, front end API. We aren't required to update all the contracts every time. The one other question I did get was how to do it with like feature management or feature toggles. It's a little harder question and it goes into like, how do you transfer that information around the system? Uh, it goes into a lot of middleware filters and headers and passing information around outside of messages. But it is something that I'm willing to cover if there's enough interest, although I really think I need to talk about feature management as a larger question. Um, but anyway, hopefully that was useful, give you some ideas, and we'll see you next time.